Uh, would you stand with me um, just as we read Psalm 16? I'd love to read Psalm 16 together here uh, in honor of God's word. Psalm 16 says this, written by David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion of my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices, and my flesh also dwells secure. For you do not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and you may sit back down. Uh, this is a, this psalm is one of those golden psalms of just resolved trust. Um, it is one of those ones that you read and, uh, um, and just in, in thinking through, and I don't know if you've had this experience or not, there are times that you maybe come across a, a writing, whether it be a poem or, or something else, it's something that really resonates with your soul at times, right? And, um, and, and, and praise God that God's word is living and active and does that for us. Uh, when there's, a, res- uh, when there's a, uh, a resonating of just what the themes are, but also what it, what it provides for us, and just focus and direction and thought and comfort. Um, and I, I think even think back just this week as well, too, this, this week of Thanksgiving and time gathering together with family, um, however your time is, whether big or small, bittersweet or not, um, there, is, there is an appropriate place uh, where we have time set aside for celebration of Thanksgiving. Um, I mean, who's kidding? When do we not really eat like that all the time sometimes? Like sometimes we eat so much, we're like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't eat like this all the time, but sometimes we actually really do. Do you remember Hometown Buffet? Do you remember like that, the King's Table? Like, it's like Thanksgiving all the time type of stuff, right? Um, but there's, there's an appropriate place, I, I think, even for, I think for celebrations such as this. And yes, uh, we gathered around the table for food, we fellowship that way, um, but, there's, but there should be a marked difference in our minds when we can... Um, when we can uh, not just acknowledge, but actually literally say to God, thank you. Thank you for your, your abundance. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your goodness. How much the scripture calls us to be thankful of what God supplies for us. And, um, and we don't need to be ashamed in that at times. We don't need to be ashamed or guilty. I oh, mean, I got so much more than other people. Now, there, there is appropriate place where we, we do gather around and we give thanks to God for his abundant goodness and his abundant grace. And just part of just even reflecting on this week and part of the theme of this psalm is being able to recognize, I think as mature believers and maturing believers, we need to be able to recognize the abundant goodness of God in all circumstances, whether they're hard, whether there's times of plenty, whether it's good, whether it's bad, to be able actually to see and thank God for his abundant goodness to us through his grace and through his, through his ministry of his spirit, his word, and through his people as well. And part of the theme of the psalm is David walks through, and, I, and I, it's funny, the, the scripture doesn't tell us when exactly this psalm was written, what were the circumstances regarding uh, David for this, uh, for the setting of the psalm, and, and you really could place it anywhere in David's life, right? Like David was always in peril. He was always in, in threat of his life. There were things that were always taking place in his life. I I, I probably more land a little bit. I think the psalm was written more towards the end of David's life. Uh, it's, there's the maturity about him writing this psalm as, as he's looking, as he's facing. Definitely, there's some sort of circumstance that, that David is facing that is threatening him. Maybe physically, his own life is in danger, so that could place it in times of Saul and Saul pursuing him. It could put, also put it in place of Absalom when Absalom usurped the throne and was trying to seek to kill him as well. But, but. It's interesting how David very quickly doesn't dwell on that, doesn't ask for a lot of help and rescue and things like that. He starts the psalm with a plea for preservation, but then he moves very quickly into how the Lord is as good. And I think, 
I think part of us as mat- believers that should be maturing is that there are things that will shake us. There are things that will threaten us. There are all things that will make us feel insecure and unsafe, uh, worried, anxious. All those things will come. But, but I think a mark of maturity is that we don't stay there very long. We don't allow that threat or those feelings or the circumstances to be the overwhelming um, uh, feelings that, that uh, drown us. But I, I pray that a mark of maturity would be it's there, we're facing it, it caught us off guard, or we, we're expecting it, and it's bigger than what we thought. But very quickly, our heart can move to a place and position where okay, but I know where my security is. Actually, I know where all my goodness is. And you see David very quickly, whatever the circumstance is, he very quickly moves to the goodness of God in this psalm. And that's why I feel like it's probably written a little bit later in his maturity. And there's a couple key verses, let me just point out to you, because I think these are the anchoring points as David just in his thoughts. And that's why we love the psalms, right? I mean, they're just a, they're a theological treasure trove. They're just a practical um, uh, uh, just a practical outpouring. You think it, it, just David's lifeline of prayer to God so much in these things. And, and I do think that there's a couple anchor points that he has in his thoughts as he writes this. Uh, definitely verses one and two there. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. I think the other anchoring point is in verse eight. I have set the Lord always before me. He's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And then the last verse, verse 11, you make known to me the path of life in your presence, there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And whatever it is that David was facing, particularly in this time, you can see he's, he, he, he's recounting, but he's also going through this movement where you see there is a, um, there is a, commi- uh, there is a uh, communion that he has with God as he cries out to him. Um, it's not wishful thinking that God will listen to him or hear him, but he, 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 is, he is pleading, he's crying out from a position of personal relationship with God, which leads, I believe, to verse 8 there where you see that there is a commitment that he has before the Lord that he has made at some point in his life, I believe early on, but that commitment of setting the Lord always before him is that steady hope and anchor that he comes back to regardless of what he is, what he is dealing with. And then last, it leads, I believe, to his confident hope. He knows what the end of all things is. He knows what his end eventually will be, like everyone else in this life, but it doesn't shake him. It doesn't even worry him. Um, But it actually is what enables him to face, just as we've been saying, why we can face tomorrow is because of that confident hope we have in this life and the next. And so those are just some of the things that I I want you to see big picture-wise overall as I kind of walk through this psalm a little bit. But just a couple thoughts, just a couple questions for you as we walk through this psalm this morning. Is your own response um, to crisis, your own response to um, finding hope uh, in the midst of hurt, hardship? Um, Where are the places your heart turns to? Who are the people that you confide in, that you rest in? Um, when you face certain circumstances um, that are a little bit more than you could bear, um, or maybe a lot more than you could bear, um, where, are, where are those people and places that you turn to? Because that matters, right? It, it, really, it matters as to where you find your hope and peace. It could be a vice. It could be a sinful vice. Uh, an escape is something that you find that at least brings some numbness, relief to those things. Um, but there's something better than that, right? There's always, there's always a place better to turn to. And is it the Lord Jesus Christ? And as we look is it this morning, is it in the goodness of God? And do you believe that in the midst of the hardest thing that you might face, that the Lord is your greatest good? Do you really trust and hope the Lord is your greatest good and the hardest of it all? And I think that's what David is driving at as he gets through this psalm. So the psalm this morning makes it clear that personal communion with God leads to a personal commitment to God, which brings confident hope in God. Let's look at a few of these verses here as we look at how David walks through this, his own soul, 
and what it is for us this morning. And we see here he starts with a plea of preservation in his communion with God. He starts with this plea that God would preserve him from whatever it is, whatever it is he's facing, uh, whether it is a threat on his life, whether it's just personal tragedy and family, betrayal, any of those things. And his plea is definitely personal as he cries for safety, for God to keep guarding watch over his life as he seeks asylum, as he seeks ref refuge in him. You think of a, a refugee, right, who's escaping whatever threat that they're in, and they're looking for a place to go of safety. It happens all around our world. It's happening right now, right? Refugees, they're looking for places where they can enter in, where they won't have the threat of their life um, under attack all the time. And who will take them in? Who will have the capacity, the power, and the ability to provide what they need in, in help and hope, but also in protection and safety? And whatever it was that David was facing at this time, the one place that he knew that he would confidently go and crying out was, there's no more secure place than in the refuge of God himself. And that was what he longed for. It's what he cried for. is what he ran to um, in his moment of need. And he uses, and you can see just how personal this is for David, because actually in those first two verses, he uses three unique names for God, the three names for God that are mentioned in Scripture that all have different, um, uh, different connotations as well, right? Because he starts off, he says, oh God, and that's just the general term God, El, God, the almighty God, the all-powerful God, the one who has the power and the ability to protect you and preserve you in the time of your crisis um, and hurt or pain. Then he calls him, he says to him, he says, verse 2, he says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, and it is the two different names of the Lord. In our Bible, English Bible, it says Lord, but maybe your Bible, the first one's capitalized, L-O-R-D, right? And that would be the intimate name of God that's used, Yahweh, right? His revealed name that he gave to Moses, the I Am, his special revelation of his name. And so you see that, that in here, David is calling personally upon God. He has a personal position of relationship with David that he's going to call on his personal name. But then when he says to him, you are my Lord, that's the small L, the small lettering, right? And that's the word for Adonai, which would be master, the sovereign one, the one who is his rightful ruler, who he has submitted to under authority and in obedience. So he calls to him, my God, he says, my Lord, the divine one, the, the one from all eternity past, but then he says, my good master, I have no good apart from you. He uses the slave language there, right? He uses the language of someone who is owned by someone else, someone who is at the mercy of another who has authority and rights uh, over them that could very easily abuse that relationship, but obviously, as we know, God does not abuse his relationship with us, and David trusts that since he's willingly submitted himself in obedience to, Lord, I trust you, and there is nothing good I have that hasn't come from you. And David, David has faced a couple moments, and sometimes it can be funny to think, well, David's the king. He's got everything, Right? I'm not going to be a king. You're not going to be a queen. Like, we're not in that position of things. David has more than I have. And yet, there's a position here where David would say, all of it aside, all of it gone away, even if, he, if this was the time with Absalom, if he was driven out, and he, he probably maybe was uncertain what the outcome was going to be. It doesn't matter. All those things aside, I trust your goodness to me. That's really where the crux of it comes down to, right? Could you actually say, if you personally lost everything, if you personally lost everything, if you were forsaken by those closest to you, betrayed, hurt, if your position of whatever it is that you hold, so that we hold so securely and tightly, and that was gone, at the end of it, could you say, yeah, my greatest good is God alone, and I'm content with that? Could you say, if all those things aside and loss, could you say, God is my greatest good, 
and I am content. And all those things are just things, and all that stuff is stuff, because I have the greatest treasure there is, and it's God himself. And David says this not from a position of arrogance, not from a position of um, condescension. And he hadn't lost everything yet, necessarily. He had the promise of God. But I think he comes to that point and that realization that if all is lost, I have my greatest good. And it's God alone. God doesn't cruelly do that to us. There are times of loss. There are times of instability. God doesn't leave us there. But in those moments, can you examine your hearts and say, all of it doesn't matter if I have God and God alone, that in him is my greatest good. And you can only do that, by the way, if you really are in personal communion with the Lord, if your fellowship with him is genuine, and if you're walking with him regularly and consistently, so that when that moment happens, you can say, I have no good apart from you. His total dependence of God and the goodness of God in all things. Even Paul expressed this, right? Paul over in Philippians 4 when he says, <laughs> I have learned the secret. I have learned to be content in all things and I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. That the issue and the matter is really a heart full of contentment in what it is that the Lord either has granted us or has taken away from us. Are you content and satisfied? And times of trials test these truths in our hearts, but it's also the times of testing that mature us into this confident hope. That's why we face these things and go through them. But in the kindness of God, he never leaves us alone, right? He doesn't, there may, there may be a time where you, there may be times where you definitely feel alone, and there may be times that you are actually lonely because of the circumstances setting. But in the end, God doesn't leave us by ourselves. He doesn't leave us out on the island to fend for ourselves and and to, and to figure it out on our own. God in his gracious goodness always, always surrounds us with himself, but most manifested through his people. And that's where David turns to in these next two verses, right? You can see a con uh, compare and contrast where he says, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. He talks about how, and saints is just the fancy word, right? It just means holy, set apart, those that have been called by God for a special purpose. David wanted his surrounding company to be those who were also part of God's people. And even those inside his circles were betraying him and hurt him. Where did, get, where did he want to be? He wanted still to be with God's people. And those were his excellent company. And that's how God shows his goodness to us. It's not in stuff. It's not in positions. It's not in the things it's with the fellowship of other believers because that's who the Holy Spirit is indwelling and that's how we know and experience the presence of God. Those are the excellent company that we keep or those that are in our, the circle of God. And here's the thing about it too, right? Like if, if you're going to, if you're going to love God's company and God's presence, you have to love the company of those who also love God. Sometimes there's this little thought, or you hear it expressed every once in a while, like depending on the circumstances and setting, somebody like, well, they're going through something difficult, and they'll kind of, maybe if you use this phrase, okay, but if you heard it like, oh, well, it's just me and God, me and God, and we're going to get through this, and we're going to do this, and, there, and there's almost an element there, and yes, the Lord is your security, and the Lord is the one that you turn to, but sometimes, sometimes it can be said in such a way that like, God, God understands us, he's got this, and it's me and him because no one else can really know what I'm experiencing. And there's almost settling there, the shutting out of other people who actually can feed into and can actually come around and come alongside and help you in your circumstance. But if you make this claim at times, or if you isolate yourself, or you put yourself in a position where you can't be touched, you can't be counseled, you can't be ministered to, because your thought is, well, it's just me and God, and we've got this, he's got this, and we've got this type of thing. You totally miss out on how God is preserving you. You totally miss out on how God is going to minister to you through his people. Don't shut out the people of God. Look, sometimes, I'll be honest, sometimes we're a little hard to get along with each other, right? 
We're a little hard to maybe see eye to eye. We have different parenting philosophies. We may have different jobs. There's not a lot sometimes that we may agree on type of thing. There's, we can find the common things and stuff like this. But I'll say this, it has everything to do with who you turn to and who you are trusting. Because that's the contrast here, right? When he says, when he says in verse 4 there, when he talks about those that run after another God, he says, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. What's he talking about here? Maybe in your translation it says they barter for another God. David's talking about an issue of trust. He's comparing and contrasting Look, I want to be in the safety and security of, God, of, God's, uh, of God's refuge. I want to be in the safety and security of God's people. I do not want to be surrounded. I do not want to follow along the same path. I do not want to be surrounded by those who are placing their trust in something or someone other than God. And there's a maturity here in David. You can see how it fed into Solomon in Proverbs as he writes through Proverbs because you can see the mature focus here in wisdom who looks and knows the end of those other pursuits. He says, I know what happens at the end for all these people who are pursuing other things. I know what it brings eventually. It brings sorrow. And not just one time, but like multiple sorrows. I know that it brings ruin. I know if I try to find hope and security and satisfaction in these other arenas of life that aren't God himself and ministered by his people, I know the end is not going to bring me the confident hope and security that I'm really needing and seeking. And he gives, and he gives, a, he gives that contrast here saying about who do you turn to in times of influence, in, in times that you would be influenced by for your security and trust. And he talks, about, he talks about blood libations here. You're like, what is the world? What's David talking about here? He talks about the names of other gods. And it has everything to do with identification and association. He says, I'm not going to doe after the practices of other people that are basically offering their soul or their life or whatever it is to gain in what they want or what they think will bring them in contentment. And by the way, I'm not even going to say the very names of things or people or other gods, if you will, because I don't want to be associated with them. That is not where my hope and my trust is. God warned about that back in Exodus and both in Joshua. He says, don't speak the names of the other gods. We should not be saying the same things as the rest of the world says around us about where we find security and hope and trust. We should not be looking for those things politically We should not be looking for those things socially. We should not be looking for those things educationally. We should not be looking for those things career-wise. Those are all the providence and gift of God's, but we should not be saying the same things as if our whole hope and future lies and rests upon this position, this person, or this practice. He says, "I, I don't want you to even speak the name. Why would God be so direct about that? Why would he be so adamant about that? Because it has everything to do with trust everything to do with trust. doesn't mean we're not going to be in the world. doesn't mean we're going to be, you know, we're not of the world. But he says, don't put your hope and trust in what everyone else is putting their hope and trust in. And I don't know what your circles are like. Look, I'm a pastor. Most of my circles are all you guys, right? So none of you guys are offering blood sacrifices around here. If you are, we got this weird, so we got to talk. Um, but like, th- th- that's not going on, right? So I don't know what your circles are. Workplace, there may be that as well too. I, to maybe bring a little more practical today, I would say, where is your influence? Where's your influence online? Who are the people that you go to, search, listen to, message with, watch their feeds, their reels, right? Type of thing where you are getting information. Sometimes it feels safer to do it behind that way because it's not a person you can talk to. And so you gain information that way and you begin to believe their message of things and maybe put some hope in there as well too. Sometimes maybe just put down your phone or instead of watching that or listening to that, actually text or call someone in the church and ask them and say, hey, have you ever faced this before? Hey, can I ask you to help me think through this, pray through this? Talk to to another believer. Message with another believer about what are the ways to think through and where your trust and your hope is as well. Not that they're going to perfectly have all the answers, but it's someone, someone that's of God's trusted people. And we see how David, it's being a matter of trust, that any other form of trust apart from God himself will not lead you to a place of secure confidence. 
that growing in communion with God means that your exclusive trust is in the sovereign care of a very good master and Lord. But David moves on from there, and he goes, as, as he just talks about his communion with God, he moves on to his commitment to God, verses 5 to 8 here, when he talks about the Lord is my chosen portion, my cup, uh, you hold my lots, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, indeed I have a beautiful inheritance. Uh, what's he talking about here? He's talking about that ultimately God is your sufficient inheritance. Um, it's familiar language, it, or it's language that David, as he writes, it's things that he talked about. Psalm 23, my cup overflows, right? He talks about lot and portion and inheritance. He's calling to mind uh, God's promise to the Levitical priesthood. Remember, there was the 12 tribes, right? And they all divvied up and they all got different portions. Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, they got two portions, which means someone was out of the loop there, right? And who was it going to be? It was the Levites. But what did God tell the Levites back in Numbers? And he repeats it a couple times in Deuteronomy. He says, you won't possess any land, any territory, any actual inherited physical portion because I, the Lord God, am your inheritance. God made that promise to the Levites and said, I am your personal, physical, actual inheritance. I am your portion. And I think David rests in that. Uh, he wasn't a Levite, uh, right? He was from the tribe of Judah. Um, I think he loved the company of the Levites because he loved the sanctuary of God. But, his, but he knew that his portion wasn't the physical inheritance, but was God himself. And so he uses this language to talk about how God is his sufficient inheritance in all things. Those that have God as their chosen portion receive the beautiful, unfailing inheritance that is God himself. We don't have any land right now from God that we claim on our own because we don't need it. Because we have God himself and his Holy Spirit that indwells us. And he is our future and present inheritance. But then there's just a more practical thing that David gives here. Look with me in verse 7. He says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. And there's just a beautiful benefit where God is David's wise counselor. How fantastic it is that you have the eternal God as your personal counselor. And you don't even have to pay him. There's a lot of money goes out a lot of counselors. If we started charging for our counseling here, I'd have a little bit nicer truck maybe. That's about it. But uh, no, like there is, a, there is an aspect where God is your personal counselor. How fantastic. And did you notice when David needs counseling the most? Did you, did you kind of catch that part? It's when, uh, it's, it, it's at night, right? In the night, also, my heart instructs me. Uh, ESV says heart. NASB says mind. Um, in the Hebrew, it's actually kidneys. So that sounds really weird, but let me explain it to you. Uh, when the Bible is trying to describe your inner person, your inner, inner man, where you are deciding and mulling and meditating on things, it uses the word kidneys a lot because that's where they believe the seat of your thinking was. Very bizarre, but that's how they took it, and that's okay. Um, but it's, it's this idea of where do, you, where do you mentally process through things. I think mind is probably a better translation here, and if you use this way, then you can work it out this way, is because where is the seat where you need to be instructed? At nighttime, I don't know about you, sometimes it's my worst time. I'm not thinking straight, or I've been thinking too much, actually. That's the problem. I've been thinking too much, and I can't sleep, and I can't get to rest, and my mind's racing, and... <laughs> <laughs> it's three in the morning the other morning, and Krista looks over, and she's like, hey, did you put out the trash cans this morning? It's Thanksgiving Day. I'm like, it's a holiday. They're not going to come. She's like, I know, but it's Thursday. And I'm like, all right, you can put out the trash cans? I'll do it in the morning, right? And then later, it dawned on us, oh, wait, trash doesn't come till Friday. It comes the other day. Okay. It is, anyway. Like, it's funny the things that come in your mind, right, all of a sudden, and you're just thinking through, but it also can be the worst time. And when do you need counsel the most? And sometimes it's not waking up your spouse at three in the morning. I, those things don't always work that way, right? But what do you need? Your heart needs to calm down. It's when you're most anxious, when your thoughts get most intrusive. And what do you need to calm yourself down? You need God's counsel, and it comes from God's word. Do you know God's word well enough so that even in the middle of the night, when you wake up, and you're rationally all over the place, 
Can you start thinking and reciting, whether memorization or just teaching? Can you, in your mind, start to meditate and start to mull over and then preach to your heart the goodness of God that you need from his word to your heart at that moment? God's counsel comes from his word from his people. It has to go into your mind. You have to meditate it. You have to know it so that when the time comes, you can preach it to yourself to be calmed down and secure. There's a wise counsel from God that comes. Remember James says in James 1.5, 1, 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given to you. There's that idea of abundance again. God doesn't just give you a little bit here, pay your, your, your allowance for the day on wisdom for today. He gives it generously. Do you pray and ask for wisdom generously? Do you ask for it and seek it that way? It's from God's word that you hear God's instructive counsel, and it's with your mind that you meditate and speak God's truth to your heart and in the middle of the night. But here's one of these key anchoring points I said in verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me that God is David's secure confidence when he says he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. There is a confident trust that God grants David that he gives him personal stability in the midst of his circumstances. And I believe David had this from early on, right? Jordan just preached on David's younger days in the shepherd. I think David, David early on in his teenage years, if not younger, committed to put the Lord before him all of his days. Now, he diverged from that path pretty bad several times, but he made the commitment that he was going to continually set the Lord before him always, and he came back to that. And when you set the Lord before yourself continually, and you come back to that, then God, in his gracious blessing to you, comes alongside you and gives you the security and stability that you need and are asking for. He walks alongside of you. He carries you through those times that you need the most stability as well. It's never too late to start setting the Lord before yourself always. But I would say this, for all of you in here that are 24 and younger. There we go. We'll just start there. 24 and younger, right? If in your earliest years, the earlier you do it, the earlier you make the commitment to set the Lord before you always, the longer path of maturity you have to walk so that whatever the Lord has for you along your path in life, that you will have a maturing confidence because the Lord is your security in the midst of whatever he may take you through. At any point, you can always set the Lord before you securely, but I would say the earlier you guys can do that, my kids included, the earlier you can do that, the more secure confidence the Lord will mature you in as you walk that path with him. This re the result of this commitment was a sense of contentment and satisfaction whose source is the Lord God. Well, we come to the kind of the pinnacle of this psalm here in verses 9 to 11. I mean, he talks about that my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. We see David's confidence in God when he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. We see how this personal communion with God leads to a personal commitment, which brings confident hope in God. One of the greatest satisfactions that we can have in this life is joy and just a rested assurance for your whole being. And I don't know if you caught this here. David actually mentions mind, heart, body, and soul. David's going to talk about all these different aspects, right? Jesus is going to affirm that later. And I think it's important to know that when God redeems you, when God redeems you in salvation, it's not just a redemption of your soul. He's not just redeeming you spiritually. God is rescuing your whole person. God is redeeming and rescuing and restoring your whole personhood. 
So that means why we also look forward to the future of glorification is that there is a bodily resurrection because God cares about your body. God cares about your mind. He cares about your heart. Yes, he cares about your soul, but he cares about your person as well. And David can say that where he says, I'm confident that God's not going to abandon, even though my body would decay and go to the grave, he's not going to abandon my soul in the afterlife and forget about me. I know that he is going to redeem all of me. My whole person is going to be rescued. And it's, that's a great joy to know that at the end of this life, it's not that there's not all that there is. It's not annihilationism where nothing you cease to exist or that we're going to be some floating spirits up in heaven. How does a spirit, you know, walk on pit streets of gold? No, no, no. You will have your body. You'll have two arms. You'll have two feet. You'll have only one head. It's two eyes still. And by the way, we'll know. We'll know. We get new bodies and we'll recognize and we'll know each other. They'll be better than they are now. Amen, amen, right? But we'll know because God is in the business of redeeming the whole person. And how could David know this? Why would David be so confident in this? Because he knew God's promise for the Messiah. And it's pretty remarkable here that David actually prophesies the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He prophesies the resurrection of Jesus Christ in this statement. And I'll tell you how we get to that in just a moment here. When he says, you will not abandon my soul to the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. Well, is David calling himself the Holy One? Is he referring to himself like he's the, no, 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 no. I, just even the way the language is and stuff, he, he, he's not talking about himself. And he's ta talking about corruption and decay because his body does go in the grave, right? And how do we know this? And sometimes we forget, David was a prophet. Yes, he was the king, but he's a prophet because he wrote the scripture. Prophets wrote the scripture. In other words, prophet was the mouthpiece, the messenger of God, and God gave the message to the prophets, and it was recorded down for us in scripture, and David wrote a great portion of scripture for us. He's a prophet. He's a prophet of God, and sometimes we forget about that. And uh, David you know, wasn't, really talking, you know, wasn't really talking about Christ. He was more talking about himself. It just happens to apply to him. No, no, no. Turn over with me to Acts chapter 2, because the apostles didn't believe this. The apostles actually preached this. First Peter is going to preach it in his great sermon in Acts 22, and then later Paul's going to affirm it in Acts, um, uh, what's the passage? Over in Acts uh, 13, actually. But let's look at Acts chapter 22, and let me read for you a portion of Peter's message to, on the day of Pentecost. Verse 22. Acts 2, 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. This is after Jesus rose from the dead, so this is after Jesus has been resurrected and glorified, gone back to heaven, and Peter is preaching the first great sermon here. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You make full, me full of gladness with your presence. So, De so Paul, uh, Peter is quoting Psalm 16. Then he says in verse 29, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did, he, did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." Right there, we have a scripture interpreting scripture. To be honest, we probably wouldn't see it as clearly as this, except for the fact that Peter preaches it and later Paul affirms it. 
This is the aspect where we understand that there are times, there are moments, as they were writing, as David's writing, as he's writing about his circumstances, writing about his settings, and he's writing about his preservation and decay of some things, but he turns in the moment there and makes this marked and hangs his hope on the fact that God had made a promise to him about one of his descendants who would be the Messiah who he knew would not die forever, but that God would not allow him to see corruption which in turn would be the resurrection for us. It's an amazing assurance that David's hope in the midst of these things was in the coming Messiah. Did he know all the details of how that was going to happen in the Passion Week? No, he didn't know those things. But he knew because his hope was in the promise of God's word and God's Messiah. And how much greater for us that our hope is in what we know for certain on this side, that it is the Lord Jesus Christ. That whatever it is that we're facing, whatever it is that are the uncertainty of our circumstances or whatever the outcome's going to be, and even the fact that when you and I die, that's not the end of it. But great praise be to God that actually we will be glorified with him because God has already done it in the person of Jesus Christ and raised him from the dead. That was David's hope, and that's our same hope as well. That's why David could face these things and say to the Lord, you are my good. Apart from you, I have no good which means that jesus christ is always your highest confidence and security in all things which when he closes the psalm there right he closes with talking about you make known to me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore what is that path of life who does that path of life go through it goes through only and always jesus christ and it echoes the Psalms to say, this is the path. Both in, there's goodness in this life, but ultimately what we receive in the next life is our greatest hope and our greatest joy, where all of it will be fulfilled and all of it will be understood. The path that goes through Jesus Christ leads into the face-to-face -face presence of God. And how fantastic, how fantastic that that is our hope. For those of you, I know for several of you, some of you have lost someone close to you this last year as well too. Uh, there's always those uh, things um, that we walk through together. For those of you that you know that your loved one is in heaven in the presence of God, how wonderful, right? To have that realization as well too. It is our hope in this life and the next. And there's a moment that we want to glimpse, right? I won't read it for you. I put it in the notes, not those of you that think that everything goes back to Pilgrim's Progress for me, but John Bunyan does write a little bit of a segment in there at the end where he talks about a glimpse into heaven and where Christian and Hopeful enter the gates and what they experience, and it's his imagination as he writes those things through, but actually it's this line at the end that gets me as he talks about Christian and Hopeful getting in there. He says, as the gates were open to let them in inside, I looked in after them and witnessed the city shining like the sun. The streets were also paved with gold, and many men walked on them with crowns on their heads, palms in their hands, and golden harps to sing praises with forever. There were also some angelic beings with wings that re responded in never-ending praise, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Then I watched them shut the gates, and I wished that I too was among them. There is that coming hope and reality, or that will be us for one day. We don't have to wish it, we will be there. But in the meantime, we walk securely on the path of life because God is our greatest good. He is our greatest joy, and that is where our hope lies. Let me pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for your goodness and your greatness in all things. I thank you that our hope, our confident hope is in you. For those of us that have made that commitment to you as our Lord and Savior, we rest and we submit into your lordship. But also, Lord, it means that we have this unique fellowship, communion with you, to know you by name, you know us, and that we can cry and plead to you at any point in time. God, I praise you for that. So God, is our hope and joy that as we walk from here, that we walk confident and secure, and even at night when we're insecure and we're worried, God, you are our counselor. You personally counsel us, and it's your word and it's your people and the presence of your people that enable us to be able to experience the joy of that blessing. God, I love you, and I thank you, and I love, I love my brothers and sisters here. 
I love that you are the Lord of our church, and we say all these things in your name. Amen.